first time I met Brian, he was unconscious and he was fighting for his life. We found out uh, that I had cancer, and that's when everything changed. Almost the entire left side of his liver was uh, taken over by tumour. It was even crazy because, like, Randy and I had been trying to have a child for a while. We were worried that perhaps his tumour might become unstable during the procedure and his blood pressure may spike. You know, I started, like most people, with alcohol, and then marijuana, and then pills. And then by the time I was a late teenager, I was a full-blown heroin addict. I picked up hepatitis and that doctor told me, well, you've just taken 20 years off your life. These areas of white are not normal. They should not be there. One day we're moving along, everything's good. The next day, your dad has liver cancer and has six months to live. Tumors, because they are growing in an uncontrolled fashion, are extra thirsty for blood. Something like this, Lorenzo, he says, I have a, a sniper squad. He says, and I go into where that cancer's at, and I go into my sniper squad and we wipe them out. We kill them all. Just over 50 years ago, surgery was the only option for many serious medical problems. Thanks to some innovative doctors and their stealth approach, we now have the tools and technology to treat these problems using a wire inserted through a tiny pinhole in the skin. No surgery, no stitches, no scars. This is an inside job. By injecting dye directly into the body, they can see the unseen. Traveling through the blood vessels like highways, they penetrate the microcosmos of the human anatomy, offering big solutions without big incisions. Expanding the realm of the possible, giving hope where there was none. This is the story of today's real superheroes, the inspired doctors who are saving lives and treating clots, cancers, disease, stroke, all without a scalpel. Every single day that I come to work, I sometimes leave thinking, how did I do that today? How was I able to do that? I'm a perfectionist, um, but at the same time, I don't allow it to rule my life. So I like to do things and I like to do things well. I think interventional radiology gives you the leeway to use fantastic technology that hasn't been around for very long to do the impossible. It's a very humbling profession to be in, to sit next to a patient and explain to them a procedure that you can do and watch them go through that procedure and then go home and get better and come back to you three or four months later and thank you because when they came to you and sat down initially, there was no hope of anything else being done for them. My name is Brian David Wurst. I'm filming. So right before I was diagnosed, both Randy and I were very active. Go. Things were going very well for both of us. We were enjoying our work. I got involved in martial arts, fell in love with it, started teaching too. We were happy. And then um, I started to get like random pains in my gut. And it would take me out of classes. It would take me out of work and stuff. And there would be moments when I was training where I would just get dizzy. It got a little scary because it kept happening and we didn't know why. And then finally my doctor was like, okay, this is not normal behavior for a 27-year-old man's body. Um, we're gonna send you for a full abdominal ultrasound. And they saw a gray mass on my liver and then the very, that very day, I got the same call from the doctor and he was like, so yeah, we've got something to tell you. We gotta come in and we found out uh, that I had cancer. And that's when everything changed. It was even crazier because like Randy and I had been trying to have a child for a while and we had found out four days prior to that appointment that we had finally been successful. Like we were just, it was so exciting, you know, like 
finally. And I guess, you know, things always happen together, right? You never get just one big life event. It just comes in clusters. So the, the baby and the treating my illness have become the centers of our lives since then. The first time I met Brian, he was unconscious and he was fighting for his life. Brian is a 27-year-old gentleman who has a disease known as a neuroendocrine disease and he was very, very ill at the time of his referral. The tumor in his pancreas and his liver was secreting insulin and so his glucose levels were too low and your brain can only function with glucose and oxygen and because his glucose levels were so low, his brain was struggling to function properly. And so Brian was in a very, very dire situation. And he was referred to me to consider a procedure where we inject little beads implanted with radiation on them into his liver to try and decrease the amount of tumor in the liver itself. I knew I had to do something because his options were very, very limited, and that if we didn't do something to try and control these tumors in his liver, that he would have died. At four o'clock on the same day, we brought Brian back down and I administered the dose of radiation to the right side of his liver. He was unconscious, breathing with the help of a ventilator because he was uh, so sick. He made a miraculous recovery. He was out of intensive care within five or six days from being in a point where he was fighting for his life. See here, this is the area of his liver that we treated before and this, all this area here is all normal liver and in between it are the little satellites of tumor. There's lots of areas now that we weren't seeing before of potentially normal liver and so it just shows his tumors have responded very, very well to his treatment. All of this before we could barely see because the tumors were so big. His left side now is the side of his liver which has the dominant disease and I think that's why he still has some symptoms. Brian's main problem at the moment is not necessarily the tumour itself, more the enzymes that the tumour produces which cause a significant quality of life issues for Brian. It causes blood pressure problems, it causes him to be very fatigued all the time. And so many of these patients who are treated aren't treated specifically for the tumours themselves, but more to try and treat the symptoms that can be very, very debilitating for them. I'm most passionate about helping people who cannot receive help from other physicians, that everyone else has given up because the surgeons have nothing to offer, the interns have nothing to offer, the urologists, the hepatologists have nothing to offer. These are desperate patients and that's what I'm passionate about because it's not hopeless for them. The buck stops here. Originally, I, I started riding a bike just to save time because it actually takes more time to drive and park in a parking lot and walk from the parking lot to my office. I frequently do have to work more than 80 hours a week, which means I can go for days without seeing my family. Even with the hardships and the sacrifices, I feel very lucky that I've found my calling and that as difficult as it is to get up in the dark and put on rain gear and get on a bicycle, I know that I'm coming to work to do something that's meaningful. Well, I figure I'm here to do service, to help as many people as I can. That's why I like to work with youth, especially ones that are at risk. I was an at-risk youth at one time, you know, like that, you know, and I was hoping I could use some of my experiences, some of my bad choices, you know, to guide some of them away from those bad choices. You know, I started, like most people, with alcohol when I was about 13 years old, and then marijuana, and then pills. And then by the time I was a late teenager, about 18 years old, I was a full-blown heroin addict. I picked up hepatitis, and that doctor told me, well, you're just taking 20 years off your life. 
thanks to God, I met this wonderful woman sitting next to me right here, and I fell in love with her, and then I had to make a choice. I do all my children have a father who's a drug addict, and my wife to be married to a drug addict? I says, no, I don't. So at that time, I quit drugs, you know, and that's gonna be 41 years, uh, March 29th, coming up. About 80 or 90% of my practice involves the treatment of cancers that cannot be removed surgically. Uh, however, we don't send these patients home to die. Well, it started in um, Santa Cruz where we live. We went to the doctors. He had finally decided to have back surgery, what this is all started from, because he had put it off and put it off. And as a family, we were getting ready for that. So I went in and had an MRI done on me. And in that MRI, they picked up part of the liver. So what we see from his MRI here, these areas of white are not normal. They should not be there. And as it turned out, there was a couple of spots on my liver. The whiteness here means that it's extra thirsty. And tumors, because they are growing in an uncontrolled fashion, are extra thirsty for blood. The doctor called and he asked me, he goes, can I speak to Lorenzo? And I said, yes. And he goes, this is Dr. Andrews. So I knew, you know, you just know because you don't get a phone call from the doctor unless, you know, it's some kind of news. And then boom, we get hit with, no, you're not having a back surgery. You have liver cancer and we're going to have to start to try to save your life because if we don't do anything, it's a matter of time. You don't have that much time left. It was not good. And then, then I started to think, well, now I got to tell my children. I got to tell the family. And, you know, I took it pretty hard. My grandfather died of liver cancer. And I said, oh no, here we go again. You know, I'm going to lose my dad. I had just recently lost my best friend uh, from the liver cancer also. He had died in June of 2013, a couple of months before they diagnosed me. And I, quite honestly, was very scared. I thought, well, I'm not gonna be living too much longer, I don't think. Brian is one of the most complex patients which I've dealt with in terms of his disease process and the degree of uh, tumor infiltration, not only in his liver, but throughout his body. Throughout this entire process, I think I would say be safe to say I've lost at least 20 to 25 pounds. He has a significant decrease in his normal muscle mass. He's lost a lot of body strength. That whole experience has been probably one of the most unsettling, to be honest. Watching yourself shrivel away is not an ever, ever a good thing. We often have to speak to patients who have been seen by many other medical specialties and they're told there's no other procedures for them, they can't have something cut out, they can't have any more chemotherapy, and these are young patients who want to carry on living. There are many procedures that we do that afford the patients that gift. We know that we're not going to cure patients, but just being able to improve a patient's quality of life and make them feel better is sometimes more important than curing a patient completely of something. Morning, Brian. I'm um, doing well. Got some sleep last night. Ready to go. Okay, good. Okay, so the plan today will be catheter goes in, we get it into the liver. Okay. Then uh, the radiation technologists will bring in the medication. Okay. We connect that up and we administer the radiation. So you won't feel anything, but I'll let you know as we go along how things are going. Sure. Okay, so we'll get you into the room in a little bit and get going. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll see you in there. We'll see you in a bit. Okay. So as you can see here, this is all normal liver, and then all this is abnormal liver. This is all tumor that we're gonna to treat today. Almost the entire left side of his liver was uh, taken over by tumor. And so he's had a buildup of fluid in his liver, and actually when we brought him in for his mapping procedure, we put a drain into him just to try and get some of that fluid off his belly because he was very, very uncomfortable. It was interesting because we were able to empathize with each other more. Like during this period where both Randy and I were, we're both distended, we're both tired, we've got both like aches. My belly swollen from the ascites, your belly swollen from a, a baby. I mean, not every husband gets to experience those symptoms with their wife when she goes through pregnancy, I suppose. It actually, in some ways, it was a good thing because it brought us closer together because we fought through it together. So Mr. Abeta actually participated in a clinical trial looking at different methods of chemoembolization. Chemoembolization involves injecting 
chemotherapy that is prepared in a way that when it is injected into a blood vessel, when enough is injected, eventually it clogs up that blood vessel. So in addition to robbing the tumors of the nutrition and the oxygen that they need, we've mixed in poison, which is basically chemotherapy. No, I'd never heard about interventional uh, radiology, and it was something very new to me like that, you know, but the doctor that explained it to me, something like this, Lorenzo, he says, I have a, a sniper squad. And I'm the main sniper, he says, and I go into where that cancer's at, and I go in there with my sniper squad, and we wipe them out. We kill them all. The nice thing about his tumors being few in number is that rather than treating the entire liver with chemo, which I would call carpet bombing, is that we can actually get these very, very small microcatheters. Some of these are only 1.7 French, which is 0.6 millimeters in diameter. So it's really, it's skinnier than spaghetti. It's more like vermicelli. So by getting a three-dimensional picture and turning it in different ways, by selecting the individual branches of the arteries that are feeding tumor, we can also then figure out which are the best angles to position the patient and to position the x-ray equipment to allow us to further advance our catheter into smaller and smaller branches. And the reason we want to do this is that we want to inject poison into the tumors to kill them. We do not want to inject poison into the normal functioning parts of the liver because that would just make the liver more sick. So what we see here is this catheter, this is a very magnified image here. This catheter is actually only 0.8 millimeters in diameter. So it's really thin. We've guided it through a bunch of loops to loops here in the arteries. The tip of the catheter is up here, which is right on the doorstep of this tumor here. And by injecting chemotherapy mixed with the vehicle, we are poisoning this tumor without poisoning any of the rest of the liver. And that way, we kill the tumor, we spare the liver, and have very, very little collateral damage. So instead of carpet bombing, we've used a sniper rifle. Brian is undergoing a treatment today known as radiation therapy or internal radiation therapy. And what we do is we place a very, very small tube into the artery that supplies either the whole liver or a portion of the liver. And we inject tiny beads which are impregnated with radiation into the tumor. That'll then cause the tumors to undergo cell death. I decided to uh, enter into Brian's arterial system through a very, very small artery in Brian's wrist. Brian, I'm just gonna put some local anesthetic into your wrist, okay? It'll sting for a second and it'll go away, I promise. Because Brian's lost so much weight, his arteries are quite small and they're very sensitive. Yeah, I don't know, just the, um, the wire just didn't want to thread through your arteries. I think it's just a bit of spasm, so I'm just going to give it a second to settle down. And in Brian's case, the artery in his wrist went into some degree of spasm. And so it was a challenge for about 10 or 15 minutes initially. And once I got into the artery in his wrist, I injected a, a, a mixture of medication. I'll re-inject this oh, blood okay. that's mixed with the heparin and the, the medication that keeps the artery nice and plump and then we'll carry on with the procedure. So you might feel a little bit of tingling in your hand. And what this medication does, it actually uh, blocks the nerve transmission to the muscles to tell them to contract. So essentially we trick the muscles for all these procedures and Brian's not an exception, he is sedated. And in his case, we had an anesthesiologist looking after that because Brian has such extensive tumor that we were worried that perhaps his tumor might become unstable during the procedure and his blood pressure may spike. And that in itself can be catastrophic. If it's uncontrolled, patients can have bleeds into their brain and it can be uh, life-threatening. 
Once you get into the artery in your hand, you can advance a wire and a catheter all the way through the artery into the arm and into the artery in your chest and then into the main artery that supplies your whole body called the aorta. And your aorta then leads you to the arteries which then supply your liver and your pancreas and your spleen. Hey Brian, take a nice deep breath in for me, mag up one. The next step after getting into position is to let the radiation pharmaceutical technicians know that we are in position and ready to administer the radioactive beads. It's a very delicate and intricate process and so they can't spill them or uh, contaminate any of the area in that room because if there is any contamination that room is then decommissioned or cannot be used for two weeks. But there's always a risk that if we inject these particles into the liver and they happen to enter into a blood vessel which either supplies an organ next to the liver such as the pancreas, sometimes the stomach or part of the small bowel, that that part of the or that organ would be exposed to significantly high doses of radiation which could all lead to that tissue dying and so there are a number of things which have to happen before we can safely inject those particles and the most important part of Brian's procedure was to map out the blood supply to his liver and that involves injecting dye or contrast into the arteries supplying the liver and getting a road map in my head exactly where I want the particles or the beads to go and also making sure that any blood vessels which are near uh, the, the liver are not put at risk when we inject the radioactive particles. So I'm in now the gastrojudinal artery but you can see there's actually competitive flow so what should happen is that you inject and then it flows away from you but you can see it's flowing back into the liver. So that's a good thing actually. He had almost protected himself because his tumors were so big, they were pulling blood from the other organs to the liver in order to get more blood. And so the flow in those two arteries was actually reversed. And that we often see in patients with very big tumors because they suck blood from everywhere. And so this would be a good position then to administer the radiation. Once we're actually in the artery that supplies the liver, uh, it's a relatively straightforward procedure. So these are the radioactive beads. And what we do now is we agitate them up and mix them up into an emulsion, almost like mixing up coffee. So you want to get them a nice even mix and then we start injecting them. And as we're injecting them, we're watching on the screen to make sure that they're flowing forward and that it doesn't look like they're going in the wrong direction. So once I've got a lot of cloudy beads in there, I'll change over. Now we inject just the sugar water in and that'll clear the line. And we do that by displacing whatever in the, in the vial with air and air ensures that there's a complete lock between what's in the vial and what's in the catheter. It's difficult to see, but there's a column of air now. And that what that does is everything that's in front of it, it'll just push it forward. Almost done, Brian. How do you feel, Brian? Mm -hmm. well, that went by way faster than anticipated. Although we look at the liver after the procedure for its, the response in terms of the tumors decreasing in size, that for me is not as important as him having a better quality of life and having less symptoms than he has currently. That for me would constitute a success. And then the only person in the world who looks this marvelous after having a procedure. I think a lot of the time radiology or interventional radiology is, is used as a, a last ditch effort for patients who have no other options. For that reason, we have the ability to impact patients' lives incredibly, changing someone's life literally overnight. Brian is doing very well today. He's had no ill effects from the procedure. His fatigue seems to be a little bit better than it was yesterday. Hello? Hey Brian, how are you? Hey, good, how are how you? How are you doing? Oh, awesome. Good. good. Okay, yeah, no, you look amazing today. Thank you. You really do. Even Thank from you. yesterday when I saw you before you went in for the procedure, you looked really tired mm -hmm. and you look like you've got amazing energy today. Thank you. Yeah. I feel way better today. Yeah. I, don't, Good. I don't know like, where it com comes from. Cause Wherever it yeah. came from, get more of it. Uh, yeah. Uh, Maybe yeah. it's the radiation. That's great. I don't Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> like a superhero. <laughs> Went to sleep last night and then woke up this morning and things have been constantly improving. Good. Well, I see that they've taken down all your fluids and your antibiotics and everything else you're on, so... My nausea's pretty much gone away. Clearly, something's happened because uh, you don't have to be on the glucose infusion anymore. So, if your sugars are okay overnight, plan is for you to go home tomorrow. Oh, you have no idea how long I've been waiting to hear those words. Good. 
it's been like three yeah. weeks or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So, wow. I'm sure it'll be good to, to sleep in your own bed and be woken up in the middle of the night by your daughter. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I'm sure you are. Especially if walking into your house for the first time as a dad. Yeah. That's oh huge. My God. That's huge. Nothing is going to be the same again. Has it hit you? Well, I came in here one month. It's another month. And now I'm a father. That's great. So it's like... That's amazing. Yeah, so you're going home not only, you know, to your wife, but to a daughter. That's crazy. It's sometimes very difficult when you're in a specialty or a job where you're doing things every day. You almost take the gift for granted of what you're able to do. It's sometimes I have to take a step back and think, wow, you know, I, I have an amazing job. He did the, the procedure on me and that's when he said, well, if you want, I can quit. You know, I've given you quite a bit already like that. It was whatever I wanted to do, Dr. Z was, would go with, along with me like that if I wanted to quit or continue. So I said, no, Dr. Z, go ahead and give it some more. I think I can take some more. So he went ahead and, and he killed all three tumors. All right, you gotta hold this here, turn this toward us like that. And you got it, yeah, bring it up down, hang on, hang on. Yeah. All right. Here we go, marker. Good. All right. Wow. <laughs> that was with authority. You're hired. Get it together. All right. Let's just talk about how you've uh, been feeling since your last treatment. I've been feeling very well. Uh, this uh, third procedure I've gone through uh, has been much more smooth. Yeah. How's your appetite? My appetite's been good. Good. I've got an excellent cook right here, so, you know, and she knows <laughs> all the right things to cook. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, as you've already seen, and as we talked about from day one, that this type of cancer is not one that is readily cured, except by transplant. So what we're trying to do here is keep all, everything under control until you get your new liver. But unfortunately, as you see, as you are seeing right now, that there aren't enough livers going around, that we have to wait for someone else's bad luck uh, in order to give you good luck, and uh, there just aren't enough donors out there. Until then, periodically, new spots are going to come up. You know, that's just the nature of the beast here. It's like a lawn that already has uh, dandelion seeds in it. And even if you wipe out the first hundred dandelions and it looks great, next time it rains, there's going to be other stuff popping up. Well, Dr. Z, I had tremendous faith in you and your sniper team, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I feel very confident. I have, I have no concern about coming back. I would rather but, not have to do it, of course. Yeah, but I, mean, I would rather you not have to come back either. But if, it, if, if that is what to be, then I wouldn't want anybody else but you doing it for Thank me. Thank you. It's just taking it one day at a time, you know, and enjoying what we got because, I mean, well, you know, we're not promised for tomorrow, you know, any of us. So that is the goal. Keep me alive long enough so I qualify for another liver. And they're doing it, you know, like that. You know, you say, not only are they doing it, they're giving me my quality of life. You know, one day we're moving along, everything's good. The next day, your dad has liver cancer and has six months to live. It really made me stop and value my family and life and look at, wow, how far we have come. We buried my grandfather because there wasn't the technology that they have nowadays to keep him alive. He didn't have a quality. He sat in his wheelchair and basically where we put him is where he stayed. You know, finally we had to end the treatment because it was just a body there. It wasn't a person. So far, I'm really, really encouraged by how well your tumors have responded. You're a good shot. <laughs> like, I just appreciate it, you know, like that, that you're allowing me to spend more time with my wife, my grandchildren, yeah. my daughter. That's yeah. why, that's one of the reasons I know I have to stay alive. Yep. I have to stay alive, you know. Yep. I'm not finished yet. No. I still got a lot of service I want to do, you know. Yep. So just got to get myself healthy, you yeah. know, and, and I'm, on the, I'm on the road to that health now. I know, but uh, what I told you is that unless you get tired of me and you fire me, yeah. <laughs> I'm your doc for life. <laughs> you know, and I, and I appreciate that because that's the way I feel. You can't get rid of me. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna We're married whether we like it or not. <laughs> I'm going to stick to you like Velcro, man. <laughs> Thank you. I like to tell people that uh, I'm living with cancer. I'm not dying of cancer. I'm living with cancer. People live with diabetes. They live with other ailments that they have. Well, I happen to be living with cancer, but I'm not dying of it. I'm living. And I'm, I'm still able to enjoy my grandchildren, my own children, my wife, my friends, my family. 
the, the treatments are allowing me to continue to live and to enjoy all these wonderful things in life. You know, I feel blessed. And as it turned out, uh, you know, he was able to get me qualified for a liver because I had been turned down the first time because I, my tumors were too big. And uh, they have certain protocol they go through and I didn't qualify. So he was able to shrink the tumors down to uh, an acceptable size. And I applied for the transplant list and this time I was accepted. I kind of always felt that the phone call was gonna come late night or early morning. It was just a day-to-day -day thing. I knew that I could get a phone call at any time and yet I hadn't been getting any. And then all of a sudden I got a phone call at 6.30 in the morning saying there was a liver available for me. By seven o'clock that evening, I was in surgery having a liver put in me. It would just made me so happy knowing that that day is finally here. That day where a new life is gonna start for me. We did get a chance to see the liver. He held it in his hand and a person that was there showing us pointed out the spots where the where the cancer was at the you scars know, that have the been scars lived. and the yeah. burns on it and stuff and uh do you know what they found no no cancer in it all those chemo immobilizations worked because uh you know he he didn't have cancer anymore and i attribute this like i say to dr z who kept me you know in spirits kept me alive kept me wanting to go forward he just encouraged me all the way you know it, it's hard because we know that, uh, you know, another person had to leave for him to get that gift. So, you know, so he says, that's my job now to uh, keep it healthy and continue. Now I'm able to get back to do a lot of my church work and my community work that I love to do. I love doing service and I felt that I get as much out of doing service as the people I give service to. And when you're grateful like I am now and you live in gratitude, it's hard not to be happy. You know, I'm a happy man right now. I can really say I'll get to see my grandson grow up to be a young man, which I prayed for, and, and see my, my children again, and just have life again. I've been given a second chance, and what more can you ask for? Brian and I have uh, uh, very frank conversations. He knows uh, that he has extensive disease. He knows that I will do everything in my power to uh, make his uh, everyday life as comfortable as possible. And if that means administering radiation or helping him uh, with his diet or uh, referring him to other specialists who can help him with other aspects of his life, uh, I will do that. At no stage do we ever talk about him not being able to cope with his disease. And Brian, again, is the epitome of a patient who is living with his disease rather than suffering from his disease. It's important to remember that you still have a life and you still need to live that life. It's not always about completely curing a patient. It's about giving patients opportunities to uh, experience things that otherwise, for whatever reason, their disease would have not allowed them to. And for Brian, probably the most important thing was being able to see his little daughter, which he did on Monday and he held her for the first time. First time in the car seat. Where are we going? To meet daddy. To meet your daddy. Just uh, walking into his uh, hospital room on Monday and congratulating him on the birth of his daughter, uh, Robin Olivia, and him smiling and just seeing the joy in his eyes and knowing that three months ago, a 27-year-old man was fighting for his life because of an uh, inoperable tumor in his liver is uh, a, a gift which I've been given, which I look forward to every single day of my life. Who's at the hospital?
there are no words. Like when you see your child and you hold it for the first time, you kind of look at it and, you know, kind of take in like pieces of you and pieces of the person you love. And now that it's its own person that you guys have created, I just, I don't think I've ever no be able to say no to that child. Like, how am I going to say no to that child? <laughs> There are many situations where I sit opposite patients and I have to tell them that there's no option for treatment or that I can't help them. I think a lot of times in medicine we try and dance around the truth because we're scared that patients won't handle it. Whereas often patients all they want is someone to be honest with them and tell them exactly where they stand. And there's many a time that we have conversations with patients and we are the ones who tell them, unfortunately, there are no other options. And it's a, it's a difficult conversation to have, but at the same time, it's one that often is more than necessary because then, in a way, you give the patient the opportunity to either seek other options or otherwise to go through the, the grieving process of accepting that their, that their disease is no longer treatable. Get older you're like what type of person do I want to be like your actions are your the final statement of any series of thought that you're gonna make no matter what you thought you were gonna do Robin, hey, <laughs> what's up? Not much, just chewing. <laughs> oh, that's good, that's good. Hey, I have some exciting news. Your daddy is home. What? <laughs> he is? <laughs> I don't see him, though. Robin, your eyes are closed. Oh, oh, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I'm sure glad he's back. Mm -hmm. 